Let's talk versatility. Let's talk tweeners. Let's talk outside corners versus nickel corners. What does that even mean? Outside offensive linemen versus interior guys on today's Peacock and Williamson. NFL analyst Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson bring you expert NFL analysis every day in less than 30 minutes. Get an inside look at the NFL on the field and in the front office with elite breakdowns to next-level analysis and in-depth information only for the real NFL fans. This is Peacock and Williamson, and it starts now. Welcome to the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Brian Peacock alongside Matt Williamson at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL. Thanks, everybody, for making us your first listen on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We love our everydayers, and uh, we appreciate it. Please hit that subscribe button on YouTube or everywhere you get your podcasts. Today's episode of PW is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I've got a competitive side. I know you do. I know Matt Williamson's already competitive about his Monopoly skills. And that's why we're big fans of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on a classic Monopoly. Join your friends, download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. Okay, Matt, uh, we we kind of we brainstormed this episode off the air because I wanted to talk about offensive linemen and tackle yeah. fit, and I was a little frustrated going through mock drafts, and, and you know everything's so need based in mock drafts, and first of all teams don't draft as need-based as these mock drafts are, which is usually the first point where mocks start to fall apart because the team says, this is the best player, we're drafting. Um, Let me stop you real quick because I'll throw one thing out too that I urge everyone to do with their favorite team or as many teams as you want. Go look at the free agents to be after this season. Those are what that's a big portion of what teams are drafting too. You know? Right. And most of the, most of these rookies aren't going to play a ton, even the first right. round guys sometimes in, in their rookie season. So look ahead one year, maybe one year. next year's needs is, is closer to what the draft needs are going to be for these teams. And, and a lot of times teams have done their work and you view something as a need and the team's like, no, we've got veteran blank at this spot. We're fine there. And we, you think that guy sucks. And the team's like, right. no, that's our guy. We're, we're good there. He's our he's our starter. We um, thought about this a year ago. We drafted that guard in the fifth round. He redshirted all year. You guys didn't get to see him, but yeah. we think he's going to be a starter and be just fine. He's not going to be John Hanna, but he'll be fine, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that happened with the 49ers. We're like, oh, you got to draft a safety here. And the 49ers knew they had something in Talanoa Hufanga. And all of a sudden, year yeah. two, he's an all-pro player. It's like, oh, okay, that's why you didn't draft a safety. You had that guy. Happens all the time. Yeah, yep. we did. We did that a year ago. We were thinking a year ahead of you guys. We're playing chess. You guys are playing checkers. You know <laughs> exactly. And they have their plan. You don't know exactly what their plan is because they're not sharing it, right? They don't want you to know what their plan is. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but in these mock drafts, every team's like, okay, they need an offensive tackle. Here's the next offensive tackle. Boom. And I get frustrated because I'm like, well, they need a left tackle. This guy's a right tackle, and this guy's a right tackle that might play guard. So I don't think that's a great fit. So I want to talk about how different some of these offensive tackles are. When we got talking about Cooper DeGene and what to do with him, and I did a podcast last night with my guy Eric Crocker, former professional defensive back, and you know I trust his evaluations on DBs. And we did a deep dive on Cooper DeGene about a month ago, and he was like, "Nope, second round guy, maybe." At corner, he he's mm -hmm. he's not a sticky man corner getting in and out of his breaks and and you know he's not going to be the guy he was billed as an outside cornerback. And then we're talking about what he could be, how he would fit into the league. And there's so many nickels in this class. And outside versus inside is the theme of today's show at corner and at offensive line. And we ended up putting Cooper DeGene at number 22 on our big board, which is higher than he liked him initially, higher than I liked him initially. But we start talking about what he is. And it's like, well, wait a second, you don't want to pass on an All Pro. Safety, big nip, nickel type of a player, which is maybe what Cooper DeGene is. So mm -hmm. I have to imagine the teams that the team that drafts Cooper DeGene, and I know you've done a lot of work on Cooper DeGene as well, Matt, and I'm curious to see how you see him as a player. Uh, and that's why I came up with the nickname Palin Ramsey, right? <laughs> right, right, right. That's the role for him is to move him around. He can play some outside corner. Maybe, you know, I, I like him as more of a cover three guy, but I want I want his eyes on the quarterback making plays, getting his hands on footballs, coming downhill, supporting the run. So I see him as a starting safety who plays some um, big nickel. And I don't see him as an outside corner. If you draft him there, maybe he's the best. Maybe he's the best defensive back in this class 
but he's just not that as a man cover outside corner. A team drafts him as that, I think they're going to be disappointed. So it depends on how you look at him, how you're going to use him for how you rank someone like Cooper DeGene. Okay, so I have a ton of notes, and, and he's a guy that's been linked to Steelers a ton, so I've done a lot, a lot of work on him too. Now, you know Eric Crocker 10,000 times better than I do. I, I think I've had one conversation with him or whatever, you know, on the air. But I will guarantee he probably knows defensive back stuff better than I do. You know, I'll concede that all day long. That being said, I do think I probably like DeGene as an outside man corner more than Eric does. Do I think that's his specialty? Absolutely not. You know, I'm always looking at this through a Steeler lens. Do I want him following Jamar Chase every snap? No. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely not. Now, I think he's more Namdi Asamoa Sherman as an outside corner. That's a good is, comp there. I like yeah. the Asamoa comp there for him, for sure. Because we saw yeah. what happened Raiders versus Eagles. You know, you can't yeah. just – this is like the whole theme of our show today. You can't just throw him in a new scheme and expect the same results. So I think he has that as a corner. Now, Let me pause you really quick. Do you remember yeah. – it just dawned on me, and I don't want to forget. Do you remember out of the same – College, it's you know, it's not exactly the same scheme and coaching staff, but they play a lot of zone uh coverages in that like, Iowa defense. Do you remember it was Josh Jackson, right? A few years yeah, ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Played a ton of zone, picked off like eight balls, mm -hmm. ended up getting drafted in the second round. And it was like, Oh, he's only that, he's not gonna fit for everybody, and you're gonna have to play a lot of man at some point in the NFL, no matter if you're a zone heavy defense or not. And he ended up not working out. And so that's right. why I kind of look at Cooper DeGene is like, yeah, okay. He looked really good in that scheme and how he was used. Don't try to use him differently and think he's going to be that guy. So I love some of your observations, you know, like I've said, go watch his highlight tape of dunks. And you're like, well, yeah, they're all off two feet. And you know, the, he didn't do the change of direction drills because ah, I'm still recovering. I'm putting that in quotes, but he did everything, every right. straight line bursty drill he did. And he did well jumps, you know, forties, but not change of direction fluid hip stuff. That's not an accident. You know, there's no question about that. Um, I do think he's more talented than Jackson. I mean, I think he's a better prospect than Jackson. I think across the board. Yeah, see that. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it doesn't mean he's going to fail, but you do need to do, use them a certain way. So for specifically the Steelers, you know, I look at the Steelers secondary and be like, it's kind of a mess, but they have two foundational players. They have Porter Jr. who follows the Jamar chases around. He's actually a shadow corner who is an outside guy. You don't want him in a slot. He's now become a prototypical man coverage long dude. And you have Minka, who is a great free safety, but you'd love for him to do so many other things. Now, if I can throw DeGene there as the third part, and he's the fill-in-the-blank guy, like I'm not asking him to be the every snap the opposite corner of Porter. You know, he gets T. Higgins, you know what I mean? But he's going to get slot stuff. He's going to let Minka sneak into the box and blitz. You know, when we play the Ravens, he might be man coverage on Mark Andrews. Week one last year, maybe DeGene lines up on Kittle or McCaffrey once in a while. You know, in, in the age of positionless football, I think he has great value. But don't ask him to play left-handed. And landing spot's going to be huge for him. Yeah. And I just really yeah. hope he goes to a team with a defensive coordinator who knows how to use him, uses him right. And to be honest with you, he's kind of similar. Um, is he maybe too similar to Mika Fitzpatrick? Or is it, or so you like him more outside corner moves inside. I think we like them more as mm -hmm. a safety who drops down, and, but can play some. Yeah, but I don't disagree with any of it. Yeah, I like all, yeah. you know. Okay. I think Mink is the best center fielder in the league. Like, I don't know if I went to Gene doing that time and time again, but if they're both in like a cover two shell and one drops down, the other one doesn't, one's a robber. It yeah. just opens up, a, you know, kind of like the bills with their guys. Interchangeability the and yeah. football and matching up with what teams like to do. But yeah, I love that. So okay. last little did. nugget, because yeah. like one year ago, after day one, if you recall, the Steelers had the first pick of day two after the Claypool trade. And I loved Joey Porter, but all that night and leading up to that pick, I said I would take Brian Branch. So what's the value of Brian Branch versus DeGene? You know what I mean? I think that's a comp too. Yeah. And Brian Branch is, and nickels are less valuable than outside corners for the most part. And that's why they're more and more valuable. Right, teams, right, right, right. teams aren't paying inside guys. It's the same on the offensive line as it is for defensive backs. Although mm -hmm. I would argue that there's never been a time where inside corners and safeties are asked to do more they're than they have harder than ever. Past. 
Yeah, and it and most of the good defenses have a really good one. And I thought Brian Branch was a steal in the second round. Maybe should have been a first round pick. So that's a pretty good comp for how valuable Cooper DeGene could be for his team and utilize it in a similar way that Brian Branch was. Yeah, I like. I think he's nom the Brian Branch, although those two have no similarities. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. He's everything and nothing depend on depending on who drafts him. He's that's not Deion true. Sanders. Yes. Last nugget, and I don't know how to exactly phrase this, but we're all joking here. He's he seems like he's the only bigger corner with a little bit of stiffness that we're saying, oh, he's a safety. Just found that curious. Oh, and, <laughs> and, and, you know, and little corners, Matt, that have some right. stiffness that can't hang outside. Let's talk about that. Outside versus inside offensive linemen and corners next. Today's episode of Peacock and Williamson is brought to you by Yahoo Finance. Wouldn't it be great if you could see all of your investments and retirement accounts in one place? With Yahoo Finance, you can consolidate your views from multiple accounts into one hub and access the expert analysis you need to tend to your entire portfolio with confidence. And, I mean, you want to grow your portfolio, right? You want to deal with the rising cost of inflation, pay off your debt, your mortgage. You've done everything right. You've saved. You've invested. Now it's time to put it all into action, take it to the next level. And for 25 years, more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. They are the number one finance destination, holistic looks at financial news cycles, uh, breaking news, editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com. The, num the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. So there is a million nickels in this class. So this adds another layer to the conversation. So you're a team and you're sitting there with a draft pick in the 20s. And there's Cooper DeGene, there's Nate Wiggins, there's Kool-Aid McKinstry. And then you look at what's available in round two, round three, round four of this draft. There's a thousand nickels. Yeah. And there's a lot of guys that you might not trust to play corner on the outside there too. So does that knock someone who's going to play inside ultimately? Because uh, the more I look at this class, the more I realize there's not that many pure outside cover guys, which is why... Wiggins, Kool-Aid McKinstry are going to be first round picks because you can't wait on the, those guys. You could pass on Cooper DeGene and still get a really good nickel later on. So I always bring these back to the Steelers and I, I try to do that folks, just because I think everyone, if you focus on your team as precisely as BP and I do on ours, you can see a lot of these similarities, you know, <laughs> as opposed to making it a general 32 team thing. So do I love Dane Jackson? No, but I think they do, and they traded Deontay Johnson for him straight up, basically. And they 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 think he's the starter opposite Porter. They need a slot. So I just talked about, hey, I would take the gene at 20, but not over a tackle. You know what I mean? Like something that doesn't grow on trees, because the third round is loaded with Sainstrill, the Florida State do. I mean, there's so many nickels. You know, I'd love Max Melton. Maybe you're going to use a second-round pick on the best ones. But right. the second, third round... I'm going to get a, a really good slot that could also play outside. You're naming all the guys like Sandstrill and Max Melton. Love those they're guys. They're my favorite. Second yeah. round. And it uh, sounds like they're not going to get past the Steelers to the 49ers if they do both go tackle in the first round. Some similar needs for these two teams. It's interesting. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And that's the thing is like, okay, there's things, you, Phillips, can't, you, know, there's right. things you can't find later. So you got to draft the outside corner, the man cover corner, the sticky guy. You got to draft the tackle because you can get that slot guy. You can get that guard mm -hmm. in round two, round three. And yeah. And and so that's what makes what's this all crazy about this here. draft is you could actually maybe get a starting offensive tackle in the third round. I mean, that's just the rarity of this draft. Even, I think I mean, maybe it, less so the guard and center depth is crazy deep. It's though. crazy. Yeah. And their first round guys at center. Like we yeah. don't get multiple first round centers, but we might get Graham Barton and Jackson Powers Johnson in the first round. And that doesn't Frazier happen. Frazier could go 40th. And then find other starting centers in the third round, in the fourth round. And it's a similar conversation. Do you pass on? Graham Barton, do you pass on Jackson Powers Johnson? Because you know there is, um, you know, a, a guy from South Dakota State that could be a starting center in the mm -hmm. NFL that you can get in the third or fourth round. And so that'll be fascinating because it does dry up at certain spots and the depth is there for those positions that are easier to find, which is the, the inside guys. 
yeah, the corner yeah. and, and offensive tackle. And it's also knowing your team and being more granular and specific about how a team plays, what a team is looking for. There's so many corners that you watch the tape and you're like, okay, well, that guy's going to move inside. Well, some some players aren't good at that. And it's like, well, I've never played it's that. Totally you're, different world. You have me to do something else that I've never done. Uh, even though that's There's so many similarities play. between secondary and O line, you know, right. like exactly. you can't t- just because you can't make it here doesn't mean you could bump inside and deal with Aaron Donald. You know what I, I mean? And, and that's where the mock draft frustration comes from for me because it's really easy to say, ah, oh, this team top need offensive tackle. Here's an offensive tackle. Well, they need a left tackle. Why are you mocking them, Talise Fuaga, who's only not played right tackle. tackle. He's probably a right tackle only in the NFL. Why would you ask him to move? He's not really prototype arm length. Some teams might even like him at guard. That's a terrible fit, you know? Um, so for that reason, it might not be as easy for every team to love every offensive tackle, every team to love every corner for their scheme. And some teams want their offensive linemen to get out on the move. And maybe that's not the strength of this offensive lineman. So gap versus zone schemes is something yeah. that's really important too. So I think it's something that to keep in mind with all these teams and why it's not so easy to just attach position to team because the style of player and there's actually, it's funny because I've seen mock drafts where literally every offensive lineman would be playing a different position for his NFL team than he played in college. Even like with the 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 Chargers. So the Chargers already have a guy playing left tackle. They draft Alt. That's like, oh, Alt could play the right side. Okay, well, you just draft the the top tackle in the draft. You're flipping sides on him, and then the you're most pure him. left tackle, the hardest thing to find, and you'd right. ask him to play left that backwards. Right, or change the guy you already have at left tackle and make him play Slater, make him play right tackle, and then you have people trying to fit Fuaga to left side. You've got. Troy Faltanu playing guard or right tackle when he's been a left tackle in college. Uh, you got Roger Rosengarten, who was a right tackle. You want him to be a future left tackle for your team out of Washington and have them flip sides, even though they played the opposite sides in college. You got Mims. You got um, you got J.C. Latham right. played on the right Manu, side. And you're like, well, they project yeah. to play the other side. But uh, so the, and then you've got the. Um, the Graham Bartons and the the Jordan Morgans are they inside guys? Yeah, are they tackles? I, I feel like there's so m- big there's such a big opportunity for these players to change positions in the NFL, which just adds a degree of difficulty. And they don't all fit. Like I know Jordan Morgan played tackle, but he's going to be a guard in the NFL. He just no, is. Thirty two and seven eighths inch arm length. Teams just say don't pass go. Shout out Monopoly go. Nah, don't pass go don't collect 200 dollars go straight to the interior of the offensive line if you hit a certain I mean, that's just how teams treat these guys with the with the shorter arms and so um that's that's a lens you have to look at this class as good as the class is there's a lot of different flavors of offensive linemen and not everybody fits everybody's scheme and need so a couple of things that there's so much on peel there too like grant barton's a pretty darn good left tackle for duke i mean he probably wouldn't even have been a left tackle at georgia he probably would have been their center you know but nine out of ten schools he's going to be a left tackle because he's good at it and he's a good football player right he's not going to be a left tackle in the you know and not going to be an offensive tackle in the nfl there's no mm-hmm. chance i mean i mean maybe it gets you out of a game in an emergency that's different but a couple things to unpack here too is if you look at it through a gm's eyes do you just get the five best offensive linemen you can? And from April to opening day, you say, that's why I'm paying an offensive line coach. And that's why offensive line coaches are the most important position coach in the league and make it work. Or do you do what we said and get, get maybe take a lesser prospect, a slightly lesser prospect, a B minus versus a B because you know he's a right guard, and I'm not going to ask him to play a center or a right tackle. I, he was a right guard for four years at Mississippi Valley State or whatever, and I'm just going to plug him right in where he is. You know, what's the best team-building move? And the other thing about it, too, which comes back to the draft, is you you kind of started that segment by like, okay, so if we're just jotting down team needs for the Saints or whoever, it's like tackle, you know, okay, if not right tackle, left tackle. It should be right tackle, left tackle. But whoever your pro scout is in your building should go to the GM and be like, okay, Fawaga is only a right tackle. They only want zone blocking linemen. Like I can eliminate 
first rounders in particular that the Saints won't take, the Falcons won't take because this doesn't fit them, coach. You know, so whenever you're sitting there at 22, 25, hoping your tackle falls, you know, there's five landmines where they're only going to like three tackles and he's one of them. Or, you know what I mean? Like, Saints is a really good example. And I know yeah. Ramchick has an injury, so it kind of maybe opens up more opportunities for more different yeah. players on their offensive line. But, you know, for the Saints, uh, I'm drafting Olu Fashionu because he's the left tackle, right? And I'm not drafting And I'm going to ask him to be a left tackle. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The fit is, is completely different there. And and so it's just a, something to to look out for when you're evaluating, when you're watching the draft, when you're wondering what – I will say this, though, Matt. Sometimes GMs and, and coaching staffs aren't on the same page. And the awesome. GM will draft a, a square peg for a round hole and say, well, this was the best well, guy. Paid to be a coach. Coach. So that happens, too. Yeah, there's coach next to their name for a reason. I always side on the GM side of it. But meanwhile, the coach is like, why are you giving me this? I can't use it at all. You know I mean? So there, that's – to me, that's a big reason for continuity in the building too. I mean, I think that goes a long way. When you're changing a GM every other year and a coach every other year, it's hard to get on the same page of, well, remember 10 years ago when we did this and we turned a center into a guard and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, like Fontenot to me is really interesting. I mean, I think he's a great prospect. And everyone's going, well, is he tall enough to be a tackle? But he had long arms and he was a good tackle at Washington. But now, but no one thinks he's a left tackle, but that's all he's ever done. You know, so right. not only are we going to switch, you know. Well, why would you move him to right tackle if you still think right. he's a tackle? He still needs length on that side. Why are you just going to switch him all of a sudden? Let him stay at left tackle. To be honest with you, just because his quarterback was lefty in college doesn't mean yeah. his footwork changes. You know what I mean? Like, it, 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 that's what makes me crazy. It's like Rosengarten is is guarding Penix's blind side. So do we think he's only a blind side protector and he has to go to the left when he has a right-handed quarterback and vice versa for Fontenot? That makes no sense at all, you know? More on the offensive line. <laughs> a couple of quotes from uh, McGinn's article who talks to all the anonymous scouts. It's, it's anonymous scout season. Some mm -hmm. very interesting, some goofy and... I think some important quotes from those scouts on a couple of these first round uh, offensive tackles in the 2024 NFL draft next. This episode of Peacock and Williamson is brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've been talking about Monopoly a lot this week and we've all been there, right? Either as a player or a fan, it's halftime. The scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low. Not sure if you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep. You lift your head up and you say to yourself, it's time to get back in the game. It's time to pull off some bank heists and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime. Tons of twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. You can also uh, charge your friends rent on all the iconic properties. You can... Uh, make your friends bankrupt if you want. Smash their landmarks with a wrecking ball. That can happen. Um, but you can also team up with your friends if you want. Crack, crack open community chests and you know win tournaments and get extra rewards and climb those leaderboards. So get back out there. Put your game face on and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store and Google Play. So taking a look at the offensive lineman here and some of the quotes and um, I, I, especially for tackle, it's like, it's like, this is like the tackle in the corner thing. Are you an outside corner? Do you have length? Do you have athleticism to mirror these ridiculously talented wide receivers in the NFL? Can you man up against those guys? Right. And for offensive tackles, those are aliens on the other side. Do you have the athletic ability? Do you have the size? Do you have the arm length? Do you have the hand size? And I think some people eye roll. And I used to eye roll when it was like arm length. I was like, come on, Joe Thomas mm -hmm. had shorter arms. Doesn't matter if you have short arms, small hands, you know. But that you hand have to play strength, differently though. Arm length, it's pretty important. And teams, even if we don't believe it, teams treat it ridiculously important for arm length. And you see these quotes for the tackles, especially every single one has some reference to. And off, especially the tackles, have a reference to the tackles' arm length, hand size. I want to start with Olu Fashionu. We talked about him. Okay. Yeah. Looking for a left tackle. There's actually not that many of them in this class who played high level left tackle that meet all the height, weight, speed, athleticism, length, arm length. And Fashionu hits all those, but he has smaller hands. Insane 
small hands. Yeah. Eight and, and a half, which is bonkers. It's like Kenny Pickett. Yeah. And almost every other guy who's six six that comes into the league out of college has, you know, nine and a half, 10 inch, 11 inch hands. Uh, Amarius Mims has 11 inch hands, I'm pretty sure. And 30 11 and a quarter. Five. I'm looking at it right now. 11 and a quarter. It's almost insane. three inches difference. I mean, open your hand right now. Three inches is a lot. For what for each hand, that's six inches right. total, right? If you're right. spreading right. your hands out, uh, wingspan is big. Um, so the the scouts, the scout said, uh, and this is like a very old school thing, right? It's like, oh, he's got girl hands. I'm like, mm. come on, what he's not, but they like they take this stuff seriously. That's kind of the point here. And like he hits everything, but a team might be like, ah, he's got small hands. It's like, well, does it show up on tape? Does he have problems controlling the lineman, getting his hands on him, gripping him? Small hands that are really strong can be fine. You know, hand strength, hand size is big for centers. They handle the ball, quarterbacks throwing the ball, receivers catching the ball, and offensive tackles and offensive linemen. You want big, strong hands for those offensive and defensive linemen because you want them to be able to control the man in front of them. So it's not nothing. I think arm length more important than hand size here, but it's just something to look for. And, and these scouts and these teams really take those really granular things seriously in the draft. Absolutely. I mean, especially if you're splitting hairs between two or three really, really good prospects, you know what I mean? Like Latham versus Fawaga, you know, or something like that. I'm trying to think of two right tackles, but Bashan, who's going to lose some ties because of hand size, what he has going for him, as you mentioned, is he has been a left. He is a left, you know, but it, everyone's read a scouting report online where when this guy gets his hands on you, it's over. Well, right. when Fashanu who gets his hands on you, it's not over. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. You can yeah. come back in the second half of that. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, so we talked about uh, Troy Faltano, and he's short. He's just under 6'4", but he's got enough length. I think he stays at tackle. I would Me I would too. try him at tackle. I would make him prove that he's an interior guy. He's not necessarily a knockback guy either as a guard. I might like him at center more than guard. But he'll fit in somewhere, kind of like Skoronsky last year, but he's more tackle than Skoronsky. I think it's as likely that these six, seven plus guys are too tall and can't win the leverage battle regularly versus yeah. Futano being too short. And one of these Patrick scouts, Paul scares the heck out of me. Patrick Paul, six, seven, Mims, six, seven plus Guyton for sure. Cause he plays upright on top. Mm -hmm. of him. I'm kind of out on Guyton. I don't like him as a first round guy. Uh, we talked about it in the ultimate mock draft special. Yeah. I like Tuamataya more because he, he he doesn't lose that leverage as much because he's not too tall, but he still has all the athleticism and the upside there. So he's kind of a sleeper for me in the in the first late first round area. But here's a quote about Joe Alt, who's six foot eight. I say it worries me a little about Alt. Yeah, and the comp was Mike McGlinchey, who came out of Notre Dame, who's also six eight, and he had leverage problems, and it showed up in pass protection in the NFL. Guys could get under him and push him around. He's like a thinner basketball build, former tight end sort of a build, which is what uh, Alt is. And the quote from the, the scout here is he's better than McGlinchey and he's wired way better than McGlinchey, more of a glass eater, uh, mm -hmm. but he's got mental stamina, which is huge for the position. He'll maybe be a pro bowl level tackle, but I don't think he'll be an all pro because he's just going to have some innate issues the way he's built talking about his height and leverage being six, eight. Yeah. And every player, uh, I mean, Jim Brown has something in the negative column. You know, and I think that's the only one that stands out with Alt. And frankly, for people that remember Jonathan Ogden, he was this guy. And he is an easy Hall of Famer. He's one of the best left tackles ever. But the James Harrison and Freenies of the world that are like six foot on a good day, that are just pocket, you know, a bundle of, you know, Elvis Doomervilles, you know, they're going to give Alt trouble. They gave Ogden trouble. You know, I mean, it's it's hard to get that low to get your hands on a spinning free knee who's basically at like below your chest level because he bends so well and, and you're just kind of pushing him away like a, you know, like a little dog attacking you or something. I mean, <laughs> it, it, and then real quick, I have Dane's beast up here in front of us and there's four of these tackles that should get drafted pretty high that are six, seven and a half or higher or taller. Paul Guyton, Mims, Alt. Alt's going to be a good player. I believe that, but to your point on Guyton, and I think even more so with Paul, at least Mims has a lot more sand in his pants. He's a lot thicker. You know I mean? Even and if you get under him, he's still going to be hard to move. It's really important with that knee bend. Can you get yeah. low? And some guys just play upright and tall, and they just can't get down there and lose leverage. And then that's what worries me a lot 
about Guyton. Mm-hmm. So up and down, Mims just looks a lot more natural out there, even just in the few reps that he's shown, which is why he's such a, a, a wild prospect to be drafted where he's probably going to be drafted. You're just, it's just a lottery ticket. You're just hoping. And that's what all the, all this, I mean, it's obvious with Mims. That's what all the anonymous scouts say here in the article is just like, I don't know, man, but you it's take a, a shot. Ticket. He's a lottery ticket. I have no idea. Yep. So last thing, and I always type back to the Steelers, they, they trade up for Broderick Jones, another Georgia tackle. He doesn't play basically the first month of the season. Then they throw him in there and he's pretty good, but he's very raw too. He's a one-year starter at Georgia, which makes him seem like the most experienced guy in the world compared to Mims. But he was very raw. He, a lot of his technique stuff needs a lot of work. But he also, even at the NFL level, was so freaky. He can be wrong technically and still get his guy blocked. And I think Mims is even more the epitome of that. You know, like a lot of people around here are like, I, I need someone I can plug and play at right tackle. I'm like, that they don't exist. And I would just throw Mims in there. And even as he learns, he's going to be right when he's wrong more than some of these other guys, just because he's bigger and stronger. On Fuaga, as we talked about, uh, scouts mm-hmm. pointing out his arms are short, 33 and an eighth. It's it's above the minimum, but it's not at the ideal, which would be 34 inch plus for an offensive tackle. But big, strong hands. Uh, the quote is, he's a true prototype right tackle. Uh, old school, better run blocker than pass blocker. That's the scouting report. So again, like yeah. really good player. Is he? Is that what you're looking for? Is the question with Fuaga? That's why. Uh, is he really going to sneak into the top ten? Maybe if the team is looking for exactly that. I'm not sure if everyone is going to be looking for exactly that. Uh, in the I home. love him, but if he doesn't make it at tackle, it's going to be because of the arms. And TJ Watt coming off. So I'm trying to think someone from the left end that's coming with speed. He might not get that outside hand on him enough. It, th- when you watch him, just think about his outside hand in protection. That's where his length will, will hurt him. It shows up, and it, it does, does show up yeah. on, as, as, as fun as he is to watch because he knocks people all around in the run mm-hmm. game. He's generally really good in, in pass protection, too, but there are some reps, and even guys with that are really good with their hands, like uh, Layatu Latu. That was the first tape I, I put senior on. Bowl, yeah. Right. And, uh, yeah. And in the senior bowl again, too. It's yeah. like you see some hand battles that he does lose because of that length, so that mm-hmm. that's why it's really important. Um, here's an interesting one. I'm going to go down. This is a non-first-round player, I'm pretty sure, but Blake Fisher rated pretty high amongst tackles here on McGinn's list. Yeah. And they were basically saying, uh, let me get the, this is wild. He's light on his feet, flexible. You put him at guard. He's got elite pass pro skills. Uh, I think he's saying as a guard, he would be an elite pass protector. Mm -hmm. Um, He's more raw, but his physical upside is at least more than Fuaga's. Talent-wise, he should be a left tackle and Alt should be the right tackle. That tells you how much they trust Alt a lot more. This pro scout thinks that, Physically, Blake Fisher, and I definitely don't see this on tape, is the physically more impressive guy than not only Fuaga, but Joe Alt on his own offensive line at Notre Dame. I'm double-checking this because I think he started out. uh, Here's what what he says. He injured his knee in his first game, which gave Joe Alt the opportunity to merge at the blind side, and then he never moved. So an injury, he started out as a left tackle, got hurt. They put Alt in there. He got Wally pipped, moved back to the right side, and then they just never changed it because it worked great. So, but but to project him to a left tackle seems crazy. He's kind of a finesse player. You know, he's not a, I I don't see him as a guard because I don't think he's physical enough to uproot the big boys, but I think he's a starting tackle very early. You know, he might be a sneaky guy that some teams like a lot. Some teams don't. And I bet he goes in the second round. Yeah, right. Like it might be that second round guy. You missed out on those early tackles that are a little bit cleaner evaluations. And, you know, Blake Fisher's in that second round area. He's kind of in the the Rosengarten territory, I think, probably prospect wise, where don't be shocked how high he goes, but he could slip into the third round. Just don't know really where where to place him. It's kind of eye of the beholder. I, 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 to be honest with you, I didn't like either one of those prospects and probably might have a player I like more in this late second round. Uh, and I view them more as third round guys, but I mean, mm-hmm. you know, maybe even very sneaky first round guys because there are some teams and some scouts that really like both of those prospects. Maybe the Chiefs or Ravens love them and they have a need, you know. Um, any other notes here before we go on the offensive linemen and some of the conversations we're having here? A uh, small one, and 
I think I mentioned this before, Brandon Thorne put this out a couple weeks ago, that he thinks it's the best center class he's seen in a really long time. At the top, as well as I think he said there might be eight to ten guys that end up being starting centers, which is a massive number. And I'm not sure I can get to that number, but as of my Steeler homework, I've been looking at what guards can be centers. And you read a lot of these quotes, the McGinn stuff, or he's smart, or he snapped back when he was in junior high. You know, like, I always find that fascinating. A lot of people think, well, he's smart. His arms are a little short. Cooper Beebe, the UConn guy, the guard, the Haynes. Can they be a center? Well, I'm not sure you can just default to center, but I do think you can manufacture a center. And then I wonder, it's like, well, why didn't he play center already? Is guard that much more valuable to that team that they didn't yeah. want to play center? There was another guy who could only play center, so you played him a guard. Cooper Beebe's an interesting one. He's playing tackle. He's definitely going to move inside. He's got shorter arms. Where really you, short arms. If you're going to move him once, move him once. Pick a side. Is he left yeah. guard? Is he center? Move him and then let him learn that spot. Someone on Twitter corrected me because, you know, you mentioned the South Dakota State kid, McCormick, because he's been a four-year starter at guard and a good one. And many of us, myself included, are projecting him to center. But I keep going, why do I do that? I mean, I, he hasn't played it at all. <laughs> and then some South Dakota State fan on Twitter was kind enough to say, you'll know who our center is soon. But uh, what's his face? McCormick would be a center. That's his natural position. We have a stud center that's coming out in a year or two. So we have kept him at guard, but McCormick should be a center. I'm like, okay, I'll buy that. That makes sense. Yeah. Perfect example. Sometimes it helps to have that intimate knowledge. It's you can get uh, as granular as you want with this stuff. And need to do more jackrabbit homework. I guess I think they have which is another reason teams are chasing the tackles early because there's so much yeah. depth at guard and all these guys pretty much can move inside. Very few of them can be like, oh, he was a guard in college. He's going to he's going to play left tackle in the NFL, but you don't see that transition. <laughs> right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for making us your first listen. Matt and I back next week. It's draft week. Let's we are go. here. All the latest entering the 2024 NFL draft right here. Peacock and Williamson. <laughs>